Hey guys, I'm going to call this video five reasons not to install Linux. Why am I doing this? I'm a Linux user. I'm a Windows user. And I think you're getting all these reasons to install Linux that you're not getting an accurate picture. You're not getting the drawbacks and you can't make an informed decision. Now, the reason for this is number one, Linux users may be lying to you. Uh, some Linux users see this more as a religion than an operating system. Uh, they will try and convert you. They don't care about your needs. They don't care about what's best for you. They care about converting someone to Linux. So they're going to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, FUD, in order to try and get you to convert. They're going to paint a rosy picture that isn't based in reality in order to try and get you to convert. One way they spread FUD is they will tell you, and if you watch my videos, you'll see I made a video about how Windows 10 telemetry does not violate your privacy, but they're going to tell you it is. They're going to tell you it's evil telemetry, and you've got to switch to Linux to escape it. What they're not going to tell you is that to actually have your privacy, because your Android phone in your pocket is violating your privacy, your Google Home is violating your privacy, your Amazon Echo, Facebook, uh, Google Chrome actually has telemetry. All these things, you'd have to get rid of them. They're not telling you that. What they're selling you on is the idea that if you switch to Linux, somehow you've got your privacy. That's not true. Okay, and I will actually show you right here where I confronted somebody. He was painting an overly rosy picture about the state of Linux gaming to somebody that was thinking about switching. I confronted him to it. And you see, he admits that a lot of the things he was saying weren't true. And then he says, but everybody else is given the downsides. So he thought he was going to paint a rosy picture for this person and convince them to switch to Linux and that they'd get the downsides from somebody else. Well, I'm the person giving you the downsides today, okay? Because I don't want you to be like this person. Why I switched to Linux and back again to Windows because they found out that Linux wasn't everything they had been told it was. Okay, I don't want you to be that person. You know, because one way they're lying to you, I wrote an article, The State of Gaming in Linux, and you see your post was removed for being a support request or support related question, such as which distro to use or application suggestions. If you read that article, pause this, read that article, you will find out that's none of those things but they're going to try and hide it from you. They're going to try and keep you from getting accurate information because they want to convert you. You see, uh, somebody right below says, it helps if you pick one of the 6300 native Linux games, you know. So they tell you that gaming on Linux is great. And some people even make videos saying it's better than gaming on Windows, but they're lying to you. Okay, the straight up, they're lying to you. And they're trying to keep you from getting information to show that they're lying to you. Okay, now let's go to Proton Database. They will tell you you can run any game you want to on Steam Proton. Okay, this is Steam Proton, their application database. You see 14,000 games reported, 10,000 games work. That's... 4,000 games have been reported not working. Now let's go into what some of these games are. Let's look at Call of Duty, Black Ops, Black Ops 2, Black Ops 3, Borked, either won't start or is crucially unplayable. Others, runs with minor issues but generally is playable. And I can't find why the, well, here's a Bronx, runs but often crashes or has issues preventing from playing Comfortably. Now you see, Call of Duty is one of the biggest game franchises out there. And you see, very little of them work. Let's go Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Bork won't start is crucially unplayable. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Bork. Destiny 2. Bork. Dead by Daylight. Bork. Daisy. Bork. <laughs> okay. How is gaming on Linux better than gaming on Windows if there are thousands of games that will not run on Linux? See, they're not giving you an accurate picture here. I'm going to, you know. So number two on my list is drivers and services. If you use Netflix, 
say you um, want to stream to your 4K TV, you can stream to your 4K TV using Windows. You can stream 1080p on your desktop. Netflix and Linux is limited to 720p. And you will run into this a lot where services either aren't offered at all or if they are offered, they aren't the same quality they are in Windows. Um, your bank, it may not work. It's other apps that you look forward to, they may not work or they may not work as well. Drivers, I'm using an Xbox One Connect as my webcam. Um, in Linux, an individual was uh, maintaining the driver for it. He had written it. He was keeping it up to date. He didn't get it into the kernel for some reason. So when he stopped maintaining it, all of a sudden, you can't use the Xbox One Connect anymore in Linux. And Linux often depends not on the companies that make the products to write the drivers, but regular Joe's. So they try and write the drivers and they may not work as well. A way you can see this is the thumbprint readers or the fingerprint readers on laptops a lot of the times won't work. Um, laptops hardware sometimes won't work. And the stuff that does like uh, power management, Windows power management is superior to Linux. If you install Linux on a laptop, you may get half the battery you got on Windows. So what you're going to have to install is a program TPU, and you're going to have to dial it back. You're going to have to cut your processor speed down way low in order to try and gain back the performance you get from your battery that you get in Windows. So there are a lot of trade-offs there with hardware. And some hardware, because you're relying on individuals, just will not work. Number three on my list is the Linux community is toxic. Now, part of this is because of the people seeing it as a religion. Uh, there are developers who won't develop games on Linux because of how toxic the community has been in the past. Uh, the community will openly attack people for any perceived uh, slight. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous, uh, the links they will go to. They also have double standards. You know, for instance, the... Uh, uh, you can't run Windows because of telemetry, but yet I'm going to have an Android phone that actually gives my location out, and such as that. Another thing is proprietary software. Now, they say proprietary software is evil. Uh, Windows is proprietary. Therefore, you can't use it. Uh, but Steam is how they get their games. It's proprietary. The games are proprietary. And the Steam store is closed source. But you can't use... Ubuntu snaps on Linux because the store is closed source. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of things like this. You can't use Windows because it's proprietary, but you can use Spotify. You can use stuff like that because they like it too. Now, I want to show you something here on how toxic they are. See, this guy, he run, ran Ubuntu Linux inside Windows. You sicken me. Somebody wrote it and was upvoted absolutely proprietary. Again, that's the thing, the double standard. The community is toxic. They will lie to you. They will attack you if you don't believe like they do, if you don't make the choice as they do, even though they're holding double standards. Uh, it's not about you doing what's best for you. It's not about you making the choices that you can live with and that suit you best. It's about towing the line in whatever the propaganda for the moment is. Number four on my list is Linux is not one thing but cobbled together parts. It's a kernel with a bunch of apps thrown together into the ecosystem. Now, every distribution of Linux is going to put different apps in there, have them configured slightly differently. So if someone develops a program for Linux, it's not really for Linux, it's for a distribution that they happen to be on. And once you move that to another distribution, it may or may not work as intended. It may have problems. You don't have that in Windows or in Mac OS because you have that whole system built together, tested together. If you create an app, you test it against that system, and you know it's going to work because my Windows 10 is going to be like the next person's Windows 10 is going to be like the next person's Windows 10. In addition to that, Windows uh, has an API that doesn't change. 
So if you've got something that was written for Windows 7, it can work on Windows 10. Not so in Linux. Um, about 10 years ago, I developed some software for Linux. I put it out there, and once I stopped maintaining it, about three later years later, I start getting reports that it just silently crashes. Okay, and that's because there is no binary compatibility there. There is no API there. Things change, and when things change, they break. So you have stuff in the repositories that may actually break that would have worked fine a year ago. But because things change just enough, then now things break. So with desktop Linux, it's often a case of finding the software, finding the distribution that has the least bugs on your system. Number five on my list, and the final thing, is you don't run an operating system for itself. You run it to launch programs. So the programs matter more than the operating system. But in Linux, they're really against proprietary programs, except when they're not, which is mostly games, mostly entertainment. Uh, in other cases, you're really against them. They're not going to pay for anything. So a lot of these professional uh, solutions are not available in Linux. And Linux people will tell you, oh, well, the GIMP is a straight-up replacement for Photoshop, except it doesn't do non-destructive editing, so a lot of professionals can't use it. Oh, well, LibreOffice is a direct replacement for Microsoft Office, except it really isn't. And when you get into a lot of the features of Microsoft Office, you find out that they're just not in LibreOffice. And if they're using a lot of those features when they make their documents, then you're not able to open it or save it properly in LibreOffice because it isn't a direct replacement. And you run into this a lot is you have different software because they don't have the commercial software. And it just isn't up to par with what you have on Windows or what you have on Mac OS. It's missing features, and plus, it, it's different. I mean, it's not a direct clone of it, so you have to learn a whole new way of doing things, which may be as easy, but is most likely a lot harder than it was doing it in Windows or OS X. So this is my list of things, and think about these things uh, before you make the switch, and maybe you're not going to switch only to find out that you made a mistake. Thanks.